appreciate it. Um, uh, so I really appreciate the time today uh, and welcome everyone uh, to our discussion. Um, we're going to focus on how to begin your OT cybersecurity journey. Uh, our agenda for today is, uh, I think we've pretty much done the intro, so we won't need to spend more time on that. Talk a little bit about the challenge, uh, and we'll try and do this with, uh, with sort of a case study uh, of an example of, of uh, the challenge that many of our ICS practitioners face in, in uh, addressing the cybersecurity challenge. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our philosophy overall as to how to approach this. Uh, we'll talk about then drawing the map. So how do we get from where we start to where our destination is and how that map is drawn. And then we'll talk through a, a case study of how well, one particular uh, client uh, went from uh, the starting point to broader cybersecurity maturity. And then we'll have some time at the end to address the questions that folks have in the panel there on the left-hand side. So as I said, we won't, uh, we won't go back through the introductions uh, to Rick and myself. Uh, I will talk just briefly about Verve. We've been in business for about 25 years. Uh, we started originally as a control system integrator, i.e. Uh, designing automation controls, et cetera. And then about uh, 12 years ago began to uh, be involved in cybersecurity and that over the last decade or so has been our primary, primary focus. Um, our, uh, as we come at this today, as you hear about this journey today, uh, it comes from our experience across these three sort of scopes of work that we get involved with. Uh, so uh, Jim mentioned uh, our platform, the Verb Security Center, um, which is an agent and agentless platform that brings together um, the full range of requirements for things like NIST cybersecurity framework and others. Um, and then from our services that we do with our customers um, in what we call design for defense, where we're helping with these roadmaps, we're helping on network segmentation, uh, uh, device hardening, et cetera. And then with uh, our customers where we provide managed services, where we're helping them maintain the security on an ongoing basis. And these three uh, capabilities and experience bases allow us to, to try and draw from our experiences to, to provide folks with, uh, with some best practices or, or points of view like we're gonna do today. So I'm gonna start with uh, uh, a, a description of a, a situation that uh, came through with, with one of our clients. Um, Elliot will take his name as is our hero for the day. Um, and the story is basically Elliot versus the GRU. Uh, not GRU, not the GRU from, uh, from the movies, um, but the GRU, which is the, the Russian cybersecurity uh, agency. Um, and Elliot wasn't intending to be targeted by the GRU or defending himself against the GRU or his company against the GRU. He was a control system engineer uh, who was in charge, frankly, of the next generation industry 4.0 connectivity uh, efforts. But unfortunately, um, on October 15th, one year, uh, in the morning, he walked in and he received an email uh, from one of his colleagues at their Belgian plant. And the email just said they were seeing some strange behaviors, um, HMIs going down, uh, certain systems locking up that hadn't locked up before and wondering if he had seen the same thing. At 8.30, this screen pops up on Elliot's computer. For those of you who don't know, this is the screen that one would see from a ransomware attack from WannaCry. And so, and this screen essentially says, uh, your computer has been locked up. Uh, you can't recover your files unless you pay $300 in Bitcoin. Um, and so obviously, uh, uh, he was quite concerned about this. Well, over the course of the next few minutes, those messages started to pop up again and again and again uh, with more and more of those messages popping up on computers around the plant. And after a while, essentially the entire, almost the entire plant had those. So at 8.36 then, a message comes out from the CIO basically explaining that they've been impacted by a cyber event. Everybody's getting this on their cell phones because their PCs are locked up. Uh, so anyone who hasn't, please turn off your personal computer and any of the manufacturing devices. They are in shutdown. 
So Elliot has gone from uh, Elliot has now faces the challenge of trying to turn off all of these computers around the manufacturing floor uh, and in the plant, uh, running around like Lucy trying to cover up the chocolates. Well, the result of this was uh, one might say catastrophic. Uh, full plant shut down across multiple facilities. Uh, number two, several weeks of recovery and rebuild of the control systems um, back going from backup from sorry, restoring from backups, et cetera. Incident response teams trying to figure out uh, where all the malware was, how to remove it. Um, it literally tens of millions of dollars of financial impact, uh, customer impact, et cetera. And so an organization that had relatively little security then had to figure out, okay, where do we go next? Uh, and so Elliot, when we got involved uh, uh, after October 15th, he had switched from the job of being the advanced process control initiatives uh, leader to now being the head of OT cybersecurity and PC initiatives kind of on the side when he could. Um, and so Elliot was faced with this challenge, but many, many organizations, many organizations that have not faced malware like this have not been attacked, but whose leadership has said, look, we have to solve this. We have to get ahead of it. We have to start securing ourselves so this doesn't happen to us. How do we begin? Where does this journey begin? Uh, and Elliot faced those same questions. And so first he had to understand, okay, so what happened? How did this happen? Uh, where do I start? How do I begin to secure these systems going forward? Uh, how do I make progress in a consistent way uh, against my security uh, uh, threats? Uh, and then most importantly, how do I do this and not impact operations in the process? Uh, so a lot of these things might be wonderful to go do, but how do I make sure the, the cure isn't worse than the disease, so to speak? Um, and so this comes back to uh, this, this challenge of do no harm, so to speak, comes back to this fundamental challenge of the ITOT uh, convergence, as it were, or how do we uh, secure ourselves in OT um, when IT has a set of tools that they want to use and approaches, et cetera. Um, IT is used to scanning things for inventory and vulnerabilities. Uh, however, OT, we need to do that without scanning because if we scan, we have the risk of, of knocking things offline. Um, in IT, we centralize the patching and the automated reboots because my PC, I can reboot that at four in the morning, no problem. However, in, obviously in OT, we can't do that. Um, we have to have localized patching with control, et cetera. Uh, similarly, configuring assets, things like next gen AV, uh, we can you know go to the cloud, immediately respond. The downside of response is is, is minor. However, in OT, uh, the downside of a of a false uh, positive means we could shut down a production line. And whitelisting may be much more effective. Um, so a range of challenges between IT and OT uh, that. Elliot and frankly everyone else uh, dealing with this ICS challenge has to face. And so as Elliot in this example or generally uh, industrial companies, they face this challenge. They face the challenge of I know I could be at threat from adversaries who I am not uh, uh, really capable personally of, of defending myself against. So how do I think about building a program uh, that can allow me to defend uh, these OT systems without putting them at risk. And so I'll hand over to Rick now to talk through a little bit of the philosophy that we bring to this concept of the, the OT cybersecurity journey, uh, and then walk through a little bit of, of the, the steps in that journey. Rick, go ahead. Thanks, John. Yeah, so great setup, and you know whether it's a uh, attack or uh, corporate. I think Rick is having some technical difficulties. So, so uh, I'll pick up for, for Rick where, where he was. So the verb philosophy. So first of all, um, we call it follow the leader. There are a number of great frameworks that we can begin with, uh, and we'll talk through a little bit of those. Uh, so our, our encouragement is don't try and reinvent the wheel when you begin this journey. Uh, learn from, from others who have done that. Number two, take a 360-degree view of the risks. What we mean by that is um, don't just focus on one type of risk at a time. Really take a step back and build a full view of the risks and vulnerabilities in your environment 
so that you can prioritize those. Number three, integrate the assessment function, i.e. identifying the risks and the biggest priorities to resolve and remediation in the same toolkits as much as possible. One of the real challenges that we have often is people who have multiple toolkits and they're jumping from a vulnerability management tool to a patching tool to a configuration tool and you end up in, in lots of service now tickets going back and forth. Uh, and so the more you can integrate that, the better. Number four, uh, design a roadmap. This is truly a journey. Um, and so what the great thing about uh, operations is we're very used to building programmatic uh, uh, type initiatives and making a difference with execution plans, et cetera. OT cybersecurity should not be any different. Uh, next, think global, act local. So this notion of being able to centralize the analysis part of OT security, but then make sure that the actions that you're going to take, those remediation actions, are controlled by the local plant people who under, or, or whether it be a plant or a control center or whatever, where they really understand those control systems and can know if any particular remediation action may actually cause more damage uh, than it solves. And then finally, there are a number of operational practices that we can leverage uh, to build on. So for instance, metrics, having roadmaps, having uh, uh, performance management systems, balanced scorecards, uh, a lot of those same tools can be leveraged in cybersecurity, and we'll talk through how to do that. So these are the kind of core fundamentals of our, uh, of our cybersecurity um, philosophy, I'll call it. Thanks, John. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you for covering there. Not sure what happened. Uh, but yes, thank you, John. There's a certain number of parameters. What I wanted to jump into was, you know, regardless of where the client starts from, the idea that this is a program and therefore needs a, a longer sort of roadmap and a longer view, or what we like to call what does done look like, um, is an absolutely fundamental starting point before you start to, you know, pull the trigger on buying widgets or solutions, uh, understanding how they fit together, um, and understanding which one makes the most sense for you. So, um, in this particular case, uh, there, there, and well, in most cases, there are multiple uh, options to help to build the standard. As you can see here on the left, um, there's been different trends and rise or decrease in popularity between the different standards. Uh, but two of the top are, are, of course, the NIST CSF, which maps multiple security from COBIT, ISO, and RCSIP, et cetera, back to sort of a common guideline. Um, but there's also the CSC20. Uh, ISO, of course, IEC, which is also the ISA, um, and of course, the, one of the precursors to the compliance NERC SIP. So there's no shortage, you know, John said the first point there, don't reinvent the wheel. There's no shortage of guidelines or basic programs to help you decide what, what done should look like. Um, one of the things, though, that they all have in common is, of course, you know, the front end inventory. You know, it's great to know we need to do something. Um, and deciding with a guideline what actual practices and controls are going to in place is, is another piece of the pie, but understanding uh, how much of that we need to do and what a asset type and volume of assets, locations, et cetera, um, is a recurring theme. And especially as you take a look at, for example, the NIST CSF, because it's sort of the, the connecting framework, uh, there are five main categories uh, where you start with identify, what do you have for assets, then you start to protect them, and then you put in more active protection mechanisms, you know, in a sort of uh, a logical path from whether you have some uh, components today that maybe could use some analysis for effect, uh, effectiveness um, or whether you're starting from scratch, um, you will go through these various categories and that once you get them sort of, you know, in place, the best practice is to come back through and sort of revisit them. So what we're going to walk through is how Elliot in this particular case uh, went from this concern to, okay, let's pick a guideline. In this case, the, this particular case study is around the CSC20. And how he then started to build the data and the, and the markers and the evidence and, and the insight that he needed to start to make uh, informed uh, summative uh, decisions so that what we do today not only um, satisfies an immediate need, but it helps us to build for future states as well. So hopefully we'll walk through uh, that sort of building blocks uh, in the next few slides here. So as I mentioned, one of the first things that they had to do, if you're familiar at all with CSC20, is that there are two, uh, the first two CSC sections have to do with inventory, inventory of your hardware and inventory of your software. 
Uh, and this is a really obvious uh, sort of statement. I mean, we need to know what we have to know how much we have to do on them, as I just mentioned. Um, but let's dig in a little bit to inventory for a second. Um, I always like to ask an audience, you know, is inventory enough to have IP and MAC addresses in general, uh, a general awareness of what the device is and, and what it does? Um, and the answer is no. Um, to me, we need a much more robust, we call it a 360-degree view of the asset because, uh, quite frankly, not all assets in an OT environment are created equal. And what do I mean by that is when we get to remediation phases or how you're, whether it's a practical design function around uh, deciding how your backup uh, rotation is going to work, you're not necessarily going to extend the same technology and manual effort into all assets as you will those which are deemed more critical to safe operations, just as an example. There are dozens of examples of how uh, the data you collect and the information you have in your inventory can impact future decision points. So we are strong advocates of the fact that when you first start at the inventory level, you want to get a very comprehensive and detailed set of asset uh, characteristics. We prefer to build full 360-degree profiles, and that's exactly what this client did. So they started with a, uh, this is a, an example of the hardware uh, breakdown, and you can see just uh, on this screen here, we have uh, different OS types along the top. Um, that was just an arbitrary split out of the data we chose to, to pull, but it, it does show that we have different classes or ages of assets, which again in the future um, might feed into system upgrade uh, functions, but in the short term certainly has impact when uh, new risks are released. So for example, we all know Windows 7 is coming near end of life, uh, looking at risks as they come out and knowing how many of those Windows 7 boxes I have that may or may not have patches to them allows me to pivot to compensating controls, right? So uh, we also have another key component on this dashboard in the bottom right, um, which we're calling operational impact. One of the things that many um, either scan-based or passive type tools sort of overlook in terms of collecting inventory is providing the additional context. Um, and one of the key components that we find is critical in managing risk going forward is not only understanding the inventory, but understanding the individual assets and their impact to operations. Uh, assets that are deemed critical impact operations are going to get a higher or prioritized uh, response than, than lower or medium impact devices. So now uh, just kind of showing what they did to build you bought first a comprehensive inventory on all assets, Windows, Linux, Unix, uh, networking gear, and embedded, uh, like Rockwell PLCs, Siemens controllers, et cetera, but then adding context to that inventory. Uh, provides value now, but also in subsequent phases, and you'll see that really come through in, in a couple of these slides, but also in the full case study. The next thing that our client did was once they had this, you know, near real time um, automatic update with comprehensive coverage all the way down to relays, PLCs, embedded equipment, et cetera, they then took other knowledge. So in adding to the 360 degree view, we uh, imported the National Vulnerability Database over top of that inventory. Uh, and this does a couple of really interesting things. First of all, it maps uh, vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities across all of your assets. Uh, as many of you are familiar with um, scan-based tools. Uh, they can only scan certain systems. They certainly don't scan embedded equipment. They can only do it under certain circumstances. So this approach gave them a more robust asset inventory, but also the overlay of that vulnerability knowledge on that very diverse asset uh, uh, list. And so we then come with, you know, which is not um, maybe unheard of, a very large number of vulnerabilities, but again, that's where understanding context can help us drill in. So they built the, the, the database, and then they built the vulnerability uh, information over top of it, and then they started to use some of those other 360-degree um, markers around the asset. And so what they did here was they looked at uh, what we call compensating controls. So we take that giant list of thousands of risks, um, and we want to be able to be focused, right, because we can't boil the ocean. Many of these these environments are starting a little bit from scratch. There's a fair amount of technical or security debt to overcome from years of not having patched and, and, and neglected password changes and best practices. Um, so being able to understand what our true risk is uh, and being able to extract that in terms of directing action but also in reporting our progress, as John mentioned earlier, is key. So what they did here was they then took all the risk and vulnerability and started to apply their own operational context to it. Um, and it's maybe a little bit hard to see, um, but you can see what we've done is we've filtered that massive list on a couple of subsets. So we take the full list of, of risks 
and we boil it down. So one of the first things they did was they said, just look at critical risks. Uh, it's, it's good to know that we have high and medium impact risks, but um, let's, let's, let's just focus on the critical ones for now. And then they looked at the impact. If you remember, the 360-degree view allows us to bring operator context. So we then filtered just on critical assets. So assets were critical to safe operations. And we immediately filtered from thousands down to a subset. But then they went on and they added two other ones. The third one is looking at another 360-degree view marker. Um, it's the backup status. They were running backups on most of these systems. But this one here is saying, show me all the backups that have recently failed. So I went from thousands of risks down to just critical risk on a critical impact asset that has not got a recently successful backup. And that's a huge uh, consideration in OT because the backup is the last fashion of defense quite often. Uh, and then just to make sure we sort of filtered even a little bit further, uh, we then brought in um, the status of whitelisting. So they had a deployed whitelisting. They were still struggling with where they could do it and how they lock it down. They didn't want to get in the way of, of, of operational challenges, but they still wanted to track how they were doing. So they had critical risk on critical assets that didn't have a backup and whitelisting wasn't yet locked down. So that not only do we not have a backup, but we don't have um, uh, anti-malware lockdown. And so two of our typical compensating controls or safety nets are not present. And as you can see here, we're down to now 69 specific risks um, as opposed to those thousands. And so this client went from not sure what they wanted to do, having a roadmap in CSC20, building a comprehensive inventory, bringing third-party markers in, and now they've become laser focused on the true risk in this environment. They're really uh, accelerating the maturity just for these first few basic steps that would give them uh, laser focus on what the true risk is as opposed to uh, otherwise seeing noise in the form of thousands of risks. Um, they then subsequently moved on to additional controls. We always talk about if we can patch bait, but then the next wave of security is what we call compensating controls. The compensating controls in OT include concepts around least privilege, so disabling guest accounts, uh, removing uh, unnecessary admin accounts, enforcing certain level of password. Uh, and so, you know, again, and also with CFC20, as you grow through the different disciplines, you build on the previous. So we've got an inventory now, we've got hardware, let's start to look at users, what users are on these systems, how frequently they're in there. And as you can see here, we've got a number of, of accounts that have been dormant for greater than 80, uh, 90 or even 180 days. These are opportunities to further reduce um, their risk, which they did. Um, and they were always working towards the standards within the CSC20 and the maturity level that as an organization uh, they chose to pursue. Um, and so sort of accelerating the, the least privilege to the next uh, view of it, um, they also used um, the CSC20 to guide uh, a checklist that we helped them deploy within the agent-based uh, technology that we provided. And the agent, once it was on an endpoint, immediately checked those endpoints for the best practice security hardening parameters as defined by the standard. So, you know, again, we went to, um, you know, this guideline. We found uh, OT-friendly type of controls. Not all of the controls made it through because some of them weren't OT-friendly. But as many controls, 46 of them that could come through and show, you know, best practice OT, like disabling the, the guest account for remote desktop for example, immediately removes a lot of the risk for the recent blue key um, risk that came up. Um, those are some of the measures. And so what they did by using this automated inventory with the agent to pull back, you know, real-time data was they then turned on this filter and said, how locked down are we? And the top bar shows the individual, the top pie chart, bar chart, shows the individual measures that they tried to deploy as an organization and how they were tracking globally against those measures. So you can see they're better than 50% on many of these or a little behind on others, but these become areas that they can then, uh, in subsequent um, remediation efforts, start to focus on and continue to lock down and dial into a higher security level. Um, the bottom bar chart just shows uh, asset by, uh, by asset how they're doing overall against all 46 measures. You can see they've got a fairly average control, uh, and that's uh, typical based on the different systems and, and OEM support or restrictions they may have had around proprietary software and settings. But they at least now have the ability to see where they are and where they're trying to go. Um, then, as we went, by the way, you know, I've shown a few of the samples of how they went from, you know, first building the inventory into actually grabbing data. Um, but this, this collection of information from the users, from the security controls that were employed, 
Uh, we also enumerated all the software that they had, including filtering against um, risky or, or known questionable software like TeamViewer or LogMeIn and stuff like that. Um, and then they continued to add to that context around the asset. We pulled in um, what open ports and services were on these devices to know where they were communicating and how. Um, we, we pulled in the data from the various compensating controls. We've already showed that we brought in backup and whitelisting, but also from antivirus. Um, in some cases, we're bringing in uh, other vulnerability threat feeds and, and information. Um, we're pulling into this database and this, and this, this wealth of knowledge, uh, firewall users and configurations. Um, the DISA STIG is, um, uh, STIG is uh, secure technology something. Um, it, it's best practice for firewalls and how they're uh, configured, like disabling that bias broadcast. Uh, we're pulling that information and bring it to their fingertips as well. And so what they do is they just build, not just from the endpoint, but the endpoint relative to all these different security functions, and all of those continue to pay dividends across the different sections of the CSE 20. The result for them was once they put the technology in and knew what they were driving towards, was they were able to build a comprehensive list of that which needed to be corrected. Um, and as you can see here, the groups, you know, obviously the endpoint is the, uh, the ultimate um, object of everyone's protection and, and, and target if you're on the bad side, um, but that you're protected through multiple layers, whether it's access control, different networks and perimeter, policy monitoring, policies and procedures, how to uh, identify. And so by building this very comprehensive real-time view with an agent right on the endpoints, an agent was talking to your PLCs to give you firmware configurations, users, et cetera, we have this very, very robust and empirical list of things that we need to do by function, whether that's create, creation and, and, and implementation of policies and procedures, uh, whether that's actually the ICS network or perimeter network architecture, how communications are, are, are traversing the various segments, um, what the endpoint looks like. Is it locked down? Is, how is it configured? How does it interact with the systems around it? And so we get a very, very robust uh, sort of to-do list, which we then take and we overlay on somewhat of a roadmap. You know, John had talked about knowing what done looks like, but also having a plan. We can't boil the ocean, and we need to slowly move through the v different stages um, to get to what our ultimate um, uh, target is. Now, we typically advocate that you start in the bottom left and you work relatively diagonally upwards to the right. Um, along the left, we've got the five sections of NIST CSF, as well as the, the enhancement of policies and procedures. Um, and these can be very specific to uh, any particular organization. Um, this is a suggested method or, or, or order in which you would do them. Uh, so you would start with your hardware and software inventory and access management policies, work your way up into what like we showed today, a bit of vulnerability prioritization, looking at configurations, and then grow into things like configuration hardening, next gen uh, antivirus, configuration change management, et cetera. So you go from this seemingly overwhelming scenario that we saw Elliot in the, in the morning, and you build you know, what, you're, what done looks like, grab the data, and then matching them up and building the step-by-step -step process becomes very natural, very uh, empirical based on the evidence, uh, and very logical, and, and we can scale that. You know, we talked in my intro that I like to build scalable, sustainable, affordable uh, plans. Having this type of data at your fingertips allows you to uh, build this as fast or as slow as complex or as simple as you'd like, but you know that you're making informed decisions the whole way. Um, so that's how we took Elliot and his team from that first sort of uh, crisis perspective into um, a framework, uh, the data that they needed to make the decisions, and then a plan to execute against it. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to John now to walk us through how that uh, actual practice went forward, both in the organizational structure, because there's always uh, a component of maintenance and ownership once you turn these things on or you're not getting the value, uh, but also uh, in some of the other cool uh, results we found from the actual case study itself. Uh, John, you ready? Absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, one of the key challenges we talked about at the beginning is how do you organize for success in, in executing against this journey, this roadmap? Um, and so we've got a few principles that we've laid out here uh, that we have found to be successful. So the first is the alignment at the top. Um, one of the things that often happens is there's different objective functions for different parts of the organization. 
uh, operations saying, I have to have uptime on my plants. I can't take downtime to do security-related initiatives. I have uh, production targets I need to hit. The CISO or others are saying, no, we have to have uh, security implemented, et cetera. And so it's key to come together with this view that Rick has described with clarity around what are the real risks, what are the vulnerabilities, and which are the priorities of things that we need to do to resolve them. So that first thing about building alignment at the top. Secondly, what we refer to is follow the money. Um, one of the, the challenges is it's oftentimes uncertain how much money an organization is already spending on cybersecurity. Uh, and so trying to get a handle around, okay, what is the appropriate budget uh, that we should uh, define for our OT cybersecurity journey? Uh, and be clear that there is a budget. That budget is not just tools, but it will be people. Uh, it may be downtime uh, to, to be able to, for instance, segment a network. We may need to take a plant down for half a day uh, or a day or whatever the time frame would be. So uh, being clear about the budgets. Next is this notion of think global and act local. So organize in a way that allows you to centralize the analysis components, um, use technology to do that, but then allow uh, that local uh, OT personnel to really drive the, the actions so that the plant operations or op uh, broadly the overall uh, controls operations remain consistent and reliable. Uh, using balanced scorecards, so as operations people, as Jim mentioned at the beginning, I spent 20 years of my career consulting with McKinsey, and one of the big things we worked on there was how do you balance things like production against other metrics that have to be achieved, whether that be environmental issues, safety issues, et cetera. And the use of balanced scorecards comes in handy. Security can be managed in a very similar way with ensuring there are accountabilities and responsibilities for these areas. And then finally, getting very tactical with very specific operational action plans that take that high-level roadmap that Rick laid out and, and get it down to very, very tactical steps. So just a few pages on that. Um, on this getting alignment at the top part, um, one of the keys to this we found is to make sure that this organizational structure aligns with your current organizational model, I'll call it. So, you know, 40 years ago, uh, this 7S model was put together, um, and different organizations are structured and the systems work in different ways. It's really important as we think about OT cyber that we work within the current models. So in, a, in one example, a company was a very decentralized organization. It had, its philosophy was we are going to allow business units to drive their decisions as long as they achieve the objective at the end of the day. So you have a profitability objective, a return on assets objective, you figure out how to get there. For that company, the right method was for the CISO to define the targets and define the standards and then let individual business units uh, pursue that target in the way that was most appropriate for them. Worked incredibly well, worked very much with their organizational model. It created, obviously, uh, some differences in the way BUs handled it. However, it increased the speed dramatically. The second example was a company that was very matrixed and really worked well in that uh, matrix approach and wanted con and, and worked for consistency, uh, consistency in tools, in the means, et cetera. For that organization, uh, it was critical that they align to specific initiatives and take a very sequential process across the whole organization. That was a slower approach, but it led to much greater consistency over time. The point of this is there is no one better or worse way, but it's really critical that it's aligned with your organizational model. Um, next is this notion of think global and act local. Uh, one of the challenges that comes up is we can't train people in every location, every physical part of our operations to be cybersecurity experts. But in many cases, the tools that we have to use are stuck, I guess I'll call it, at that location. And so it's key that we can pull that data out and allow a central team of subject matter experts uh, to l analyze things like networking and uh, co um, compensating controls, et cetera, design the remediation activities, uh, and then push those actions down, potentially through some sort of a, a regional team, but down locally, 
so that the plant IT engineering teams, et cetera, can control those actions. Um, and obviously in the process of that, automating as much of the final step of the actions as possible, but allowing the organization, uh, the, 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 those people closest to the cold face, so to speak, to ensure that they have a, uh, a visibility of those actions. And then, as we mentioned, having a balanced scorecard. So certainly there is, uh, uh, operations management is very used to these kinds of things. And so bringing in appropriate cybersecurity scorecards is one of the advantages of these standards, for instance, the CIS top 20. There are metrics that we can measure against, and we can start to create dashboards, as Rick was showing you before, to allow people to manage against this balanced scorecard to know how they're doing and to report on it in a very simple way um, and to allow them to have exceptions and compensating controls, et cetera, but to have that balanced scorecard um, that, that brings cybersecurity to that same level that safety would be and other things. And that's really this next chart is to ensure that we can establish clear progress goals and metrics as we go through this journey. It's not going to happen overnight. We can make a lot of progress in individual sites in a very short period of time uh, because of the toolkits that, that Rick talked about. Uh, but the, uh, the idea that we can uh, then monitor against each of these metrics in a, in a singular way and know how we're doing is critical. Just so you know, I know this is very, very small print, so apologies for that. But essentially, all these individual bars are individual uh, elements of the CIS uh, controls. There are 170 of them or something. Um, and each one of these bars is whether, how many devices in that, uh, for that particular control are compliant. And the top is the broader compliance across plants. Um, and so having this kind of data, whether it's in Verve or some other tool, having this kind of data allows us to measure and manage our progress uh, just as if we were measuring production quality, et cetera. So I'm going to pause there for a moment and just talk a little bit. Um, I, I mentioned FERV and our different components at the beginning of this. The reason um, we, we, we approach this, or, or maybe a better phrase, how we approach this that Rick was talking about before, so what does Verve do to do this? Um, and Jim mentioned this at the beginning. Our platform is a, uh, uh, includes an agent. It includes an agent list component and then integrations with various other third-party tools. And so Verve puts a OT agent on all of the Windows-type devices. We then connect to all of the embedded things, switches, routers, plus all of the embedded things like PLCs and relays and controllers. Um, and then we'll integrate with antivirus software, et cetera. And then all of that comes up through these asset managers up to the reporting agent without any need for additional hardware, all this is done through software and virtualization. And then from that reporting console, we can design the actions that then get pushed down to the local level. As I mentioned, they can get controlled locally uh, by those plant operations. Uh, there are a, a variety of, of advantages to this approach. Um, number one, as we said, it's software-based, so there's not a lot of uh, hardware that needs to be deployed, so it's relatively quick to deploy. Uh, number two is it gives you that 360 view that Rick was talking about before. Number three is it's closed loop, and what we mean by that is not only can we see that there's an issue or a risk or a vulnerability, but we can immediately pivot to actually fixing it. So we can go to that, that roadmap and start to action immediately on patches, on configuration, software removal, user account removal, et cetera. Uh, it does allow you to think global and act local, as we talked about with that architecture. And then finally, many, almost every organization we find has already done some things, right? They've got AV going, they may have backups, uh, uh, backup software, et cetera. And so uh, the key in any program is not to try to rip out things that are already there, but to build on them. Uh, and so in our case, we've, we've integrated with uh, these third-party tools. Whatever tool set you use, uh, we would encourage you to not rip and replace, but to think about how to like, build on uh, what we've already done. And at the end, uh, what this gets, this kind of a program uh, approach, 
allows you to have measurable improvement in your overall cybersecurity program uh, that you can track and measure. So what you see here on this chart, the gray bars, is where this particular client was um, to, before uh, they implemented the journey. So they had that level, and this is the NIST cybersecurity framework, the main elements of that. And then the, the orange or brown or bronze bars above is where they were uh, after they deployed the journey uh, and they executed on the journey, about a nine-month journey in this case across dozens of different, this was a utility, of dozens of different uh, generation uh, and transmission sites. Um, and they remeasured where they were at the end after deploying VERB, but then taking these actions uh, to work through the roadmap. And so again, there's a, the key is that as you go through this, you can measure your progress and at the end see truly significant progress and systemic improvement in your overall cybersecurity. So some practical next steps. Uh, number one, uh, if you're in a plant type environment uh, or somewhere that has, that has individual um, units that you can take, assess one or two of those individual units um, using this asset-based assessment uh, to provide yourself with a real view of the risks. Number two, prioritize that roadmap for your particular environment by site, uh, cross sites, et cetera. Third, from day one, try to bring the OT and IT teams together to leverage the various capabilities, but recognizing that there are gonna be unique requirements from OT, but we need to work together because there are lots of learnings that IT has had over time. And fourth, execute remediation in one place. Uh, in, a, in a subset of your environment. Learn it, uh, document that remediation, uh, those fixes, what worked, the challenges, et cetera, and then begin a rollout process uh, that you can start to remediate and address uh, other locations. Uh, important to have clear OT standards and policies as you do this in parallel. Um, and then accelerating the assessment, et cetera, and then importantly, training and executing uh, monitoring and maintenance. Um, and so what you end up with then is a clear journey with milestones, risk prioritized, and importantly, building the capabilities as you go. So with that, uh, I'll pause um, and end the formal part of our presentation uh, and um, uh, open it up to the questions that we have here um, that have been asked. And so Rick, maybe you and I will go back and forth a little bit on the questions that are here that have been asked. So if anyone has any questions, obviously, please, um, please send them away. Okay, cool. All right. Well, listen, guys, uh, just, you know, thanks again to, for the great presentation. Um, you know, as we're covering uh, cybersecurity and control, you know, one of the main things is the, the, a lot of the tools are getting easier to use, but it's hard for, you know, champions within organizations to convince their uh, they're, you know, the, the folks that are, aren't as far along the learning curve how to do it, and, and a lot of these tools can do that. So uh, well, we already have uh, several good questions, and, you know, while we start answering them, uh, every, you know, other folks in the audience, you know, can feel free to continue to send us some more of them. Uh, the first one right now is uh, how can we align IT and OT IS security using a single roadmap? Sure, I'll take that. Uh, and then, Rick, maybe you pile on. So um, one of the, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the keys is to bring these groups together early on. Um, we think having some form of a standard uh, that you agree on between IT and OT is really, really helpful. We've seen, uh, you know, as we've entered particular clients, we've, we've found that they've spent weeks or months or longer debating on, standards or an approach, et cetera, uh, going back and forth. By taking, by going with um, some standards that exist, whether it be the CIS Top 20, uh, NIST Cybersecurity Framework, ISA 99, it allows you to start working off of a, a shared uh, vision, objective, uh, what have you. Obviously, then, you can tweak things, you can edit things, you can create exceptions, et cetera, but it allows the group to come together around a common uh, set of goals. Um, and then the next point I would say is oftentimes there's, we hear a lot of the can'ts. 
well, in OT, we can't scan. We, we can't do a vulnerability system. We can't patch. We can't uh, put an agent on a system. Uh, and what we've found in, in the 12 years we've been at this is there's a lot of cans uh, that we need to find a way to provide the information, to provide the kind of security that the CISO, the CIO, the board is expecting. Um, and there are ways to do that. There are creative ways to do that, some of which that uh, you could use Verb, you can use other tools, but there are ways to achieve those, uh, those objectives. And so trying to find common ground and realize that uh, the IT organization, particularly the security organization, um, has uh, objectives that they're trying to achieve and how do we make that work uh, within an OT environment um, and having a kind of a can-do attitude uh, we found to be quite important. Rick, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, no, that's a great, actually, just want to jump into that. The ITOT debate is, is on and heavy and it's everywhere and it's a, you know, panel session at every trade show I go to. But at, at the end of the day, the reality is that we're all trying to row the boat in the same direction. And so as long as we have shared common objectives, like what done looks like, um, and we can work towards it, that's great. But what I think needs to happen is on both sides, like John said, on the OT side, we need to change the can't do it to maybe we can do it. But on the IT side, we also need to be a little more lenient in, um, letting the OT side pick the path to get there. So I always say, you know, we'll get to where we need to get to, but we may need to use different tool sets. For example, uh, we have a client that is using scan-based vulnerability analysis and, and SCCM for patching. The reality is that you can't use the scan-based, you know, throughout the OT environment. And secondly, SCCM for patching only covers half of the OS types in the OT side, including Linux, Unix, et cetera. So, um, we both want to do the best practice in vulnerability uh, analysis and management, but if we agree that that's the target and now we're going to look at what makes most sense for both sides, we'll get to where we need to. We just may, it may look a little different than what either side might, might think of, but it's, it's ultimately the best, most sustainable uh, solution as opposed to having multiple solutions or a solution with partial coverage and a bunch of manual uh, you know, feeding to keep that up to speed. Uh, so, yeah, I, I totally uh, – that's a great question, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to jump in on that. So, so then, guys, um, uh, you know, one, once they achieve some of the organizational alignment and, and, you know, some of the objectives, you know, are settled on, how, how should they uh, – the question here is, you know, how do you display the roadmap and how do you design it to be effective and useful? So, uh, okay. great yeah, Rick, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you, you had the, the, the dashboard one there. Why don't you revisit that one and, and maybe uh, maybe walk through that a little bit? John, you there? Sorry, is that the dashboard you were talking about, Rick? Yeah, yeah. I think this is part of a roadmap. Um, anyways, yeah, go ahead. Well, so. Um, there are, I think there are a couple of different things you want to portray in the roadmap. The first is uh, what good looks like or what done looks like, as Rick said. So having a picture of the metrics that you're trying to achieve um, in something that's measurable and you can go back and track, we think is really key. And when you first do this chart, it'll all, well, it won't all be red, but it's very, very red. Um, and obviously this is fake data, all the, all the pies look the same. But the point is that, you know, when you first do this, it's a very red picture. Um, and that is a way of demonstrating, okay, you know, we have some, some particular issues. But we really do like to be able to then end up with something that, that has this kind of a roadmap picture. I'm trying to go back to if I can. Oh, may not let me there. Um, but basically the, the idea of laying out over time what are the series of programs that we're going to do um, to uh, like this roadmap here where you can lay out the specific initiatives and when they're going to happen uh, so that you can really have clarity for the management team on, okay, what's coming next and when is it coming uh, and then what are the specific uh, initiatives underneath? All right. And, um, Next question here is, uh, could you talk more about the deployment side, uh, i.e. agent versus agentless? Because I guess that's kind of a new concept or, or word for people. Yeah, I, I can jump into that for a bit. So when we come, we come into an OT environment, 
Um, there's obviously a, a, a large number of both IP enabled but also serial, serially connected devices. Um, and, and all of them potentially have risk, right? So uh, we actually categorize assets into three categories, um, OS-based devices, uh, and then everything else, which is in two other categories, networking and communications gear, and then the typical, you know, what we call embedded or OT gear, so relays, PLCs, controllers, et cetera. Um, our approach to getting that deep, robust inventory is to put an agent on the OS-based devices. Um, and it's a very small footprint, if, you know, a few megs for install. It uses less uh, resources than the calculator app. It's been proven in, in uh, well, in, in general uh, for about 20 years, and we've been doing it in OT for about 11 or 12 now. Um, so very, very safe, very powerful, et cetera. And it helps give us up to 1,100 characteristics about the OS-based devices, and it also um, – uh, lets us make changes and manage those OS-based devices. So if you remember, read-only or planning is great, but being able to make changes is even better. Um, and then we use what we call agentless profiling. So we're going to connect to um, your Cisco gear using SNMP, your Palo Alto, your Checkpoint, what have you. We're going to use the same communication paths, the same credentials, the same ports and services that you're using anyway. So we're not adding new or invasive you know, communication paths. And we connect to uh, the end devices um, in, the, in a language or protocol they're used to. So SNMP for switching network gear. We can talk uh, Telnet, SSH, uh, uh, CIP, Ethernet IP, um, to embedded relays, PLCs, controllers. And in those cases, we actually talk to the Rockwell PLC, for example, and say, give me the rack, give me all the cards in the rack, show me the back plane, pull all that data for you. And so it, it allows us to extend inventory, which is often an OT in the OT security market, uh, fairly spotty or uh, very intense, you know, installation, WMI calls, scripting, et cetera. And it makes it a very seamless, manageable, very small footprint, but results in a real-time inventory. One of our clients, for example, uh, at a central headquarters monitoring multiple generation facilities across multiple states, uh, has data that's never more than 15 minutes old at their fingertips. And to take that one step further, we have another client that's got 600-ish sites in 57 countries around the world, and corporately they can look at any single asset at any single one of those sites, um, whether it's OS-based or agentless uh, relays, PLCs, controllers, you name it, and look. So, for example, you know, Vendor X sends out a, a firmware update. Uh, they can instantly know how many of them they have where. So it's a really powerful way to build that base analysis and that understanding that feeds into these other stages of the program. All right. Well, we're almost out of time here.